gonna say something crazy and radical. You wanna hear it? I don't know <laughs> yeah. if you're ready for this. You ready? <laughs> Let's do it. Just let them come. Mm. Let them come. Let them be here. This is a nation of immigrants. This country has constantly been replenished by mm. people who come here seeking a better life. And those mm. people become the American dream. What up? It's Dramos, and this is the recap. Of course, as I do each and every week, breaking down some of the biggest headlines from this last week. Now, my guest today helped me break it all down. He is a former congressional candidate and a community activist. He's been on the show a ton of times, Hector Oseguera. He'll be hopping on in just a little bit to help me break down some of these headlines. And man, it's been a crazy, crazy week. But with that in mind, I first want to just get something off my chest. So, man, let's uh, let's quickly dive into some of the BS from this last week. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this because, you know, there's a lot of topics I want to get into with today's guest. But I did want to address something. Now, it is sadly a fact that people are losing their minds over the Little Mermaid remake because it stars a black woman as Ariel. Yes, you heard that right. People are losing their minds over a cartoon. Now, to be blunt, let's let's call it what it is. Specifically, white people and their fragility can't seem to handle the idea of a black woman playing the role of the Little Mermaid. Like, yes, you, you heard me correctly. These conservatives who have been on the front lines, right, fighting the, the good fight against cancel culture, they have now reversed course and decided that the Little Mermaid needs to be canceled. And, and get this, they've even come up with their own, you know, cute little hashtag, right? Hashtag not my Ariel. I wish I was kidding. But I mean, listen, like like white people, I, I get it, right? Like these are... These are really scary times, right? Because, you know, if we're not careful, it it starts with the Little Mermaid being black. But but who knows where it goes from there, right? Like, can you imagine if, you know, this whole inclusion and and diversity thing, if, if it got so out of hand that our schools, you know, uh, began to actually teach the real history of this country and, and how our country, you know, has been built uh on the idea of celebrating white mediocrity? Can you imagine? <sighs> of course, you know, we we cannot have that, right? So so let's just ignore, you know, of course, the, the long and, and well-documented history of, of Hollywood whitewashing the stories of people of color, right? Like, like, that's perfectly fine. But a fictional children's story about a fish, that's where our colonizer friends they draw the line. Huh. Only in America, of course. Now, with that said, let me bring on today's guest because I don't want my blood pressure getting too high here talking about this stuff by myself. He is a former congressional candidate, an anti-money laundering specialist, and a community activist. My guy, Hector Oseguera, how you feeling, bro? Good, bro. Thank you for having me on. Always a pleasure. Of course, of course, man. I mean... There's so much going on in the world. I always enjoy our conversations. I love having you consistently on because I think you just have a, a really great, you know, man, just frame of reference and always st stay well informed. So I appreciate you hopping on. I also know there's a lot of things going on locally uh, in, in, in Jersey City where, where uh, you know, we, we met and uh, a lot of interesting political things happening there that you're working on. So I want to get into all of that. But, but first and foremost, if it's cool with you, I kind of want to Touch on, um, man, some of these headlines. There's a lot going on right now. Absolutely, yeah. All right, so I mean, let's let's start with with what's going on with this this hurricane that that has you know, man, decimated parts of the the Caribbean. Um, I know if I'm not mistaken, your family is Dominican. It's gone to the Dominican yep. Republic. Yep. Um, you know, obviously I'm Puerto Rican. We're we're seeing a lot of a lot of damage. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of major flooding. And and in, in Puerto Rico specifically, a place where the infrastructure hasn't gotten the support that it needs, um, where already they're short on, you know, medical funding. And, and because of this idea, there's another way to put it, that we're second class citizens in the in the eyes of the of the United States. You know, we've already been hurting. And then you add this on top of it. I mean, so 
first and foremost, you know, all that you're seeing that that's going on, you know, and and the response uh, or lack thereof, kind of what's your, your take on what you've seen thus far from the U.S. response and, and kind of the, the global community as a whole? Right. So, you know, first and foremost, prayers to the people of Puerto Rico and the people mm-hmm. in DR, anybody yeah. suffering under this hurricane. Um, but unfortunately, what we see now is not all that different from what we've seen in the past, right? You know, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm i no fan of Donald Trump, and he got a lot of flack, respect, right, rightfully so, when he was uh, throwing jumpers of uh, paper towels at the people <laughs> yeah. of DR, right? But yeah. at the end of the day, how much different is Joe Biden just because he's not throwing things at people doesn't mean that the neglect is not also still there, right? Right. And you said the people PR are second class citizens, and I agree mm-hmm. with you, but I would take it a step further to say that um they treat Puerto Rico and the people who live there like a colony and like mm-hmm. colonial subjects, right? Because right. one story that came across my timeline was a bunch of white Americans mm-hmm. who go to PR yeah. and live there for the tax benefits of yep. it, right? And now that the hurricane's coming, wh- where they at, right? They mm-hmm. came back. They all dipped. So, right. so they're there for the good times. They're there to party. They're there to drink. They're there mm-hmm. to enjoy the splendor and the beauty of the island. Mm-hmm. But once, you know, things get tough, they're not a- above dipping and, mm-hmm. and taking all their money and all their resources with them. So, right. you know, PR is really treated like a colony. Mm-hmm. And that is the state that the United States has had it in for a very, very long time. So I think that uh, if we're going to see a change, it has to come from that perspective. We got to stop treating them like a colony and treat them just like every other American, right? If this was Florida, mm-hmm. if it was Texas that was hit with a hurricane like that, there's no way that we would just leave them to fend for themselves the way that we've left them. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a great point. And and I, I'm glad you brought up that that story that's been going viral with the the men, these gentrifiers coming in there and and getting out of there the first sign of trouble. Um, but also when you had the death of, of the queen, right, in, in Britain, this brought up a lot of conversations about the idea of colonizers, right? And right. the fact that the United States is still participating in in this age old thing and, and it's, you know, affecting the people of Puerto Rico. And there's been a lot of protests, a lot of conversation, particularly amongst, you know, our generation um, and, you know, wanting to finally see a change. We've had so many different bills introduced that never, you know, actually uh, see the light of day when it comes to something actually, you know, substantial coming from them. I mentioned the um, the medical funding, you know, and I was watching a piece uh, today where they were talking about, you know, even the poorest state in the country, Mississippi, gets more money in federal dollars for for medical funding than Puerto Rico does. Right. So, right. you know, people are, are already hurting. You know, the infrastructure has already been hurting before these natural disasters. I mean, I've heard a lot of talk. I've interviewed and and re- you know research various Democrats who have different ideas on the, you know, what it, what we should do with Puerto Rico, right? I've heard it should become a state because Democrats believe it'll become a democratic state, right? I've seen the the AOCs of the world that, you know, want self-determination, you know? So, I mean, for, for you, how do we how do we kind of solve this problem? What What is the, the pathway towards, you know, you know, getting the, the people of Puerto Rico the representation that they deserve or, or giving them the freedom that, you know, uh, I, I think is long overdue in my opinion? Right. So, you know, to me, my first go to is that the people of PR should decide for themselves. So whatever they mm-hmm. want to be, that's what we should respect. Right. If they want mm-hmm. to be a state, we should honor it and and go 100 percent and treat them as first class American citizens. Right. But if they don't want to be a state. We should let them have their own country and mm-hmm. stop with this. What I would call vulture capitalism, mm-hmm. where we send all of these people to exploit PR. And mm-hmm. so. It's, it's this saying that is there's socialism for the rich, but capitalism for the poor. And that's what you have in PR, that mm. all of these very wealthy people will go out there. They get tax benefits. They get all these breaks from the government. Right. But then where does it where does that show up? Does it ever get to the people? Of course it doesn't. Of course it doesn't, because there's more money to be made in the exploitation right. than to letting these people determine for themselves what they want to be. So if PR would like to be its own independent nation, we should let them determine for themselves their economic and political future and and stop trying to like stop trying to rob them blind the way that has been done for so many generations right right and that's a a a great point you know last thing i'll kind of touch on is is building off of what you said you know when we talk about why nothing has happened because there's so many financial interests in it remaining the same way that it is right now you know absolutely the tax breaks the big corporations that are in the pockets of these politicians right they are enjoying the benefits of 
of having this, you know, very generous, uh, you know, tax incentive when it comes to Puerto Rico and the the amount of profit that they could pull from people. Plus, the United States, the the tariffs on shipping and things like that, we're making money off of the Puerto Rican people and and the fact right. that they have to pay more money for these goods that are that are imported, right? Than than anywhere else, uh, you know, if they were bringing it in themselves. Now, moving on from that, we're we're talking about people that sadly are not being treated with respect or dignity. Let's talk about what's happening with these migrants, right? Who right. unfortunately are just becoming pawns in a political game of the Republican Party, right? You had Ron DeSantis uh, sending uh, migrants to Martha's Vineyard, uh, you know, and, and he's actually now being sued um, right. as a result of that because people are saying they were led there under false pretenses and promises. Um, things like uh, they were going to be provided housing and, and going to be given, you know, uh, immigration status updates quicker and things of that nature. Uh, Greg, Greg Abbott of Texas has joined in on the fun uh, of this whole political performance. Unfortunately, uh, man, you are seeing, you know, even uh, Donald Trump's border wall. Now, uh, right. Biden reportedly is is trying, to, trying finish to finish that. Right. right. You know, I mean, so much going on. It, it feels like we're being screwed at both ends over here. I mean, what is kind of your, your take in, in some of the things that I'm bringing up over here? Well, starting with the immigrants and and how they're being treated, you mm -hmm. know, these people are uh, they're seeking asylum. They're refugees, right. um, mm -hmm. so they're here legally. So, just for all those Republicans who want to talk about, you know, undocumented people, these are people seeking refugee right. status. And so, it's not like your traditional random person who runs across the border mm -hmm. and is here illegally. That's number one. Right. Number two, you know, I love it when you have all these Trump people who focus so much on human trafficking and are mm -hmm. talking about things like that, because now you have Republicans literally engaged in a form mm. of human trafficking mm. and they're trying to play blind. They, they're, they're acting like they did something so amazing and so, right. you know, trying to give um, blue states their comeuppance. Right. And it's really sad because this is what they tried to do is that they tried to ship humans to states like Massachusetts and New York expecting mm -hmm. that in these blue states, they're going to be treated with the same racism that these Republicans want to treat them with. Right. But people are welcoming them with open arms. You know, my mm -hmm. wife is is a teacher in New York City and mm -hmm. they're taking in the children. They're even offering to wash their clothes, you mm -hmm. know, to, to donate stuff to them, food, clothing, whatever it is they need. So, you know, I think it's shown that um, there is a little bit of a difference between maybe not the political parties themselves, but right. between the sort of mentality mm. of what you see in a red state where they want to be as cruel as possible mm. to people who are in, in desperate need and yeah. the really amazing and beautiful things that you've seen from people in Martha's Vineyard in New York City who are opening their arms to, to these people who are saying, you know, this is a nation of immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, there's always a Bible passage that I go back to that's Leviticus 19.33. And it's treat the foreigner in your land as a native born because mm. you yourself were a foreigner one time. Mm. And so you should treat a foreigner as a native born. Don't mistreat them. Don't give them any sort of second class status. Mm. Treat them as a native born because that's how you would want to be treated if you, for some reason, had to run away from your native country. And so mm -hmm. they're, they're absolutely, unfortunately, you know, between if you're talking about the Republicans and Democrats, you get the cruelty from both parties, right? right. Before Trump, Obama was the deporter in chief and people mm -hmm. don't like to talk about that, but it's, it's literally the truth. Sure. And and sort of looking at the, the political aspect of this, you know, I, I think we've talked about how, you know, the Latino community, we're not really necessarily Democratic based. People try to act like Latinos are Democrats by default, but that's not really true. I mm -hmm. got dark skinned Dominican cousins who are Trump Republicans. Right. So right. they exist out there. But when you see this sort of cruelty and this sort of inhumane treatment of human beings, that's when the Republican Party really loses from the Latino community because human beings recognize that this is wrong and don't want this sort of behavior carried on. So despite yeah. the fact that, you know, Latinos come in every shape and, and political ideology under the sun, right. when you see inhumane treatment like this, it's very easy for Latinos to say, OK, this party definitely doesn't represent me. Right. No. And I, I think that that's a, a, a great point. I mean, let's quickly let's quickly touch on what we're talking about here with uh, with with Biden and finishing Trump's border wall because I, right. I feel like 
sadly, that's not getting spoken about a lot, right? right. That, unfortunately, that's not the headline that it should be, you know, and, right. and to to be fair, we had no problem putting Donald Trump in the news when it came to that border wall. But right. now, you know, liberal media isn't holding Biden to the same standard. So let's discuss that quickly, kind of, you know, your reaction seeing that, uh, you know, Biden has begun construction once again to finish this this wall. Yeah. And, and what that really tells me, and, and it's something that we've known for a long time, is that the two parties are really the same, right? Mm -hmm. a, a really intelligent person once said that um, in America, you don't have two parties, you have one party, and it's the business party. And, and mm. that's what you truly have. You know, um, Obama, like I said, was the deporter in chief before mm -hmm. Trump. And the, the mistake that Democrats always make is that they believe that they're going to talk tough and act tough in right. a certain way and that other and that the Republicans are going to give them credit for it. The Republicans mm -hmm. don't care that Biden is finishing Trump's border wall, just right. like they don't care that uh, Biden is going strong on Ukraine and is being very militaristic. Right. Mm -hmm. So the Republicans are the ones who have the credit for being the militaristic party. They're the ones who get the credit for right. being anti-immigrant. And the Democrats do these very idiotic things of trying to say that, oh, well, I'm appealing to the middle. See, yeah. I can be as cruel on immigrants as the Republicans. I could be as mm. militaristic as the Republicans, but they don't get credit for it. All they do is erode um, the confidence that their base would have in them. So it, it's I think it's very disappointing. It's disappointing, but it's not surprising is what I would say. Thing. Right, right. That, that that's a great a great way to put it. Yeah, it, it's not shocking to read that. It, it is incredibly disappointing, though. I mean, so let let's kind of tie it up a bit, you know, neatly for for people. I mean, in your opinion, how do we sort of you know solve this this border crisis? Because there are a lot of people coming from a lot of countries who are are seeking refuge, you know, and and are coming from really terrible circumstances and need saving. Right. How how do we we solve, you know, this this issue in a way that is both, you know, humane and, and also, I, I guess, you know, is is what's best for for this country, if you will. OK, I'm going to say something crazy and radical. You want to hear it? I don't <laughs> yeah. know if you're ready for this. You ready? <laughs> Let's do it. Just let them come. Mm. Let them come. Let them be here. This is a nation of immigrants. This country has constantly been replenished by mm. people who come here seeking a better life and those mm. people become the American dream. Mm. It happened with going back to the English who came here looking for religious freedom, right. the Irish, the Chinese, Indians, Pakistanis, Latinos, mm -hmm. people come to this country looking for opportunity. And every time that they do that, the people who are already here mistreat them mm. and, and abuse them. And despite all of that, this country has continued to be a beacon of freedom and opportunity for people. That's why they're coming here, because mm. whatever they have here, whatever they're going to find here is better than whatever they left back home. Right. So let them come. We have jobs that need filling that a lot of light skinned American people do not want to <laughs> do and are not right. going to do. And we have supply chain crises. We have uh, an economy that's not doing the greatest. Mm -hmm. We need people in this country who want to do those jobs. So let them come. Let mm -hmm. them come. Nobody loses a thing. And in fact, we gain tremendously for it. You know, the only reason to put these sort of artificial barriers in place is mm -hmm. for racism or mm -hmm. for, you know, xenophobia uh, Donald Trump would call people coming over breeders. They would say they bring mm -hmm. diseases, all this kind of like crazy stuff. That's right. just not true. Mm -hmm. You know, let these people come. They will enrich our country. They'll make us a better, stronger nation for it. And we won't lose a single thing for it. So let them come. This is a country that they, that supposedly is a nation of immigrants. And we have no reason to artificially stop them from coming. Very, very re revolutionary uh, and, and crazy idea. I, I, I love it. Let the, let America actually do what it's supposed to stand for. Uh, very, very, very crazy idea. I, I love that solution. So last thing I want to touch on is, as we mentioned, Donald Trump a few times uh, and Trump can't seem to keep himself out of the news. Uh, mm. He it's been announced uh, at time of recording that he's being sued by uh, New York, New York State, the attorney yep. general. Letitia James, James has has announced that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's for some sort of financial fraud. Yep. Um, and then on top of that, we've obviously got the ongoing case surrounding these classified documents um, from that were seized in, in Mar-a-Lago. Now, first and foremost, we had the the first uh, hearing right that uh, around right. this um, 
And, and there's this talk, first and foremost, about the idea of a, a special master is being requested. Can you explain for anybody not familiar what exactly that means, first and foremost? Sure. So basically what's happening is that you have all these classified documents that you just can't let anybody look at, right? Because sure. they contain very secret um, information. And so you need a what is called a special master's, which is a person who has the clearance, who has dealt with these sorts of cases before and can make mm -hmm. um, a determination mm -hmm. as to what truly is classified, what can be in the public domain and what cannot. Because, you know, when you bring something to court, all of that goes into the public domain and all of that becomes something that people can search out. Mm -hmm. But when you're dealing with things like nuclear secrets or when you're dealing with spies and, and that sort of stuff, you really can't allow some of those things to become part of the public record. And sure. so you, they, Trump asked to appoint a special master's, which is somebody in the judiciary, a judge mm -hmm. who has a history of dealing with these sorts of cases, who mm -hmm. can make an informed determination as to what truly should be classified and cannot be seen by the public and what can become part of the public record. And honestly, it, um, this is sort of like a give to Trump mm -hmm. because under normal circumstances, this is brought before the judge who makes those sorts of determinations mm -hmm. what trump was arguing is that we can't trust the courts themselves to make these right. determinations and so we need a third party to mm -hmm. make that determination and that's what the special masters is intended to be is a third party that's technically even though they're a judge is not part of the case mm -hmm. to make these outside determinations okay so that that now we have that basis and that's a great explanation now in the meantime of, of, of this you have the the judge uh, in this hearing basically telling Trump that uh, you either provide proof that you declassified, you know, these these documents. You have some sort of proof that, or a reasoning why and an explanation why these documents were allegedly declassified by you or essentially let's move on from from that argument. Right. Right. Uh, I mean, last time I talked to you, you had your doubts about. The idea of a former president being brought up on, on charges and, and possibly even jail time uh, because of tradition, right? Now, right. all that has transpired since then, has your opinion changed of the uh, maybe possibility of, of Donald Trump actually facing some sort of real charges and then potentially jail time even? I would like to say yes, I really would. But the fact mm. of the matter is that my opinion remains steadfast that, you know, people like Trump tend mm -hmm. to escape uh, accountability for these sorts of things. And, and I'll just give you a quick example, right? I have sure. a friend who's in the Navy and he worked on, you know, what I'll call very sensitive information, which is like our nuclear arsenal, right? Mm -hmm. If my friend took one scr the corner of a document that was mm -hmm. top secret and had mm -hmm. it in his home, I would never see this cat again. <laughs> he would be in Gitmo right now. Right. Right. right? So for you to find boxes and boxes and boxes of documents that are clearly made labeled classified mm -hmm. and that we're even having a discussion as to whether or not this dude yeah. is going to face accountability to me says that, you know, we, we still are in a place where someone like Trump is probably going to escape liability. You know, mm -hmm. I hope to be proven wrong. I really do. I, I pray to God that we live in a country where everybody was judged by the laws equally. Mm -hmm. But that's just really not the country that we live in. People yeah. like Trump, elites, wealthy white men tend mm -hmm. to escape accountability, no matter how egregious mm -hmm. uh, their violations are. You know, the, the news that says James is, is investigating him for fraud to me, that sort of stuff has more um, clout behind it because mm -hmm. that's part of a state case. And yeah. if Trump is to be brought on to justice on anything, it will very, I would say that the odds are better in a state case than a federal case because mm. we just have this system where people like Trump are able to flout the laws and are yeah. able to do all sorts of crazy stuff that dramos if you had a classified document right. anywhere in your vicinity bro yeah. <laughs> you would be in get we would not even be able to have this conversation and so right. I, I wish to be proven wrong on that I really do hope that this dude faces accountability I just don't think that our system is designed to do that to people like Donald Trump. Yeah, I think that that's a, a, a very fair point. I, that's why I try not to get too excited when I see these things, uh, because 
I, I, I also am a bit pessimistic of, of it actually being something real that that sticks, you know. And not um, even so, pessimistic, just realistic about right, what right. our country has done in the past. Yeah, yeah. Sadly, you're you're right. It's not even pessimistic at this point. So, uh, lastly, let, let's touch on some of the work that you're doing. I, I'd seen you on on social media uh, posting a story that's been getting a lot of attention, rightfully so. Um, and and it relates to exactly what we're talking about, right? People who uh, have power come from a, a family of power, and and then being able to sort of be above the law for things that you or I would be in handcuffs for, right? So Absolutely. talk to me a bit about what's going on in in Jersey City with a, a, a congresswoman over there and, and, and kind of what uh, you guys are trying to get done. So basically, long story short, is that this very powerful politician out of Jersey City, her mm -hmm. name's Amy DeGeese, she hit a bicyclist, a bicyclist with her car and mm -hmm. drove off. It was mm -hmm. a hit and run. Yeah. She turned herself into the cops six hours later, six mm -hmm. hours later. Just, mm -hmm. at, you know, for any of your viewers, think if you if you were to commit a hit and run, if you think you would have six hours to be able to turn yourself in. Right. Right. She turns herself in and is not arrested. She was given mm -hmm. basically what amounts to a parking ticket. Mm -hmm. Right. For a hit and run. Mm -hmm. And she is somebody who is one of the most powerful people in Hudson County. Her father currently is the county executive mm -hmm. of Hudson County, which is basically one of the major political bosses. Mm -hmm. And so. You know, we've been organizing to get this woman to resign because committing, you know, anybody can make a mistake, right? Has sure. she hit this gentleman and pulled off to the side and checked on him to see if he was okay? This probably wouldn't be a story and we wouldn't be talking about it right now. The fact of right. the matter is that she hit him and ran off. And why does mm -hmm. she do that? Because she's part of this political elite who mm -hmm. believes that she can do what she wants. After right. that, after this incident, more stories have come out. One time in Hoboken, she was about to get her car towed and she basically tried to extort the police officer and say, you know, I've been endorsed by the by the police unions. I'm mm. I'm a Jersey City Councilwoman. I um basically said I called somebody in the mayor's office and he told me that you have to let me go. And, mm. you know, I'll give all credit to the police officer because he refused to be intimidated. He said, basically, you're about to get towed right now, no matter mm. what you tell me. Right. Um, e even more stories have come out. This woman makes over two hundred thousand dollars a year between several jobs in Hudson mm. County. And she lives in low income housing. And mm. as you know, yeah. Jersey City and Hudson County is a very expensive place to live. It's yep. very difficult to find affordable housing in mm -hmm. Hudson County and especially in Jersey City. There was a recent story that Jersey City is one of the most expensive places to live in the entire country. Mm. So how do you have these political elites making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year able to get, um, you know, essentially low income housing? Right. Not only does she have a low income housing unit, her partner has another unit in the same building <laughs> and she owns a home in Jersey City. Wow. So this is just like a story of political corruption up and down. And we've been organizing to have her resign. We've mm -hmm. been trying to reach out to the mayor of Jersey City, to Governor Murphy to try to do the right thing. Unfortunately, you know how these political elites, they all run in the same circle. So we, we don't right. expect them to do the right thing. We're hoping to organize the community to force the change that we want to see. And so that's really what I've been working on for the last um, two months, essentially, since mm. she committed this hit and run is trying to rally the people of Jersey City to speak in a loud voice and say that this behavior is unacceptable and this person mm. should not represent the people of Jersey City anymore. Yeah, I I, I think that that's so I mean, anybody who hasn't seen the, the video, I, I laugh just because it's so egregious, like there's literally multiple camera angles like you know from different streets you could see her speeding away on different streets it's like there it, there's literally like this is the the perfect sort of uh way that you've seen somebody doing a crime right like i've never seen clear clearer footage or evidence of somebody doing a crime in my entire life yet like you said she got a, a slap on the wrist and is still you know maintaining her her position in the in the council so man i appreciate you bringing stuff like this to light you know, because, uh, you know, this is a, another example kind of 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 like a mini Trump of the world. Right. And right. and if we don't hold these people accountable, they become bigger and bigger issues, uh, you know, uh, until say they become one of the crazy people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who, uh, you know, is is a, a real threat because of the amount of influence that she has uh, these days. So it's important to hold people accountable when Absolutely. when necessary. Absolutely. So, Man, I, I appreciate you hopping on the show, giving us your perspective. As always, I appreciate the the work that you're doing in the community. Uh, let people know where they can can check out your Instagram and, and follow up on, on this story and, and how they can kind of activate if they need to. 
So yeah, Dramos, thanks, man. It's always a pleasure to be here. People who want to find me on, on the gram or on Facebook, uh, you can find me on my last name, Oseguera201. Um, Twitter, Oseguera2020, going back to the congressional race. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very active on social media. If anybody wants to chop it up and wants to get involved politically, please reach out. We're always looking for more good people to get involved. But it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for talking about these stories, because if it wasn't for you, man, you know, there's not a lot of media who's willing to give this perspective. So big shout out to you and, and salute to you for the work that you're doing as well. And, and thanks for having me on. Of course, my bro. Always a pleasure. Man, big shout out to my guy, Hector Oseguera, for not only hopping on the show, but, but for also just doing the work and always being someone who fights on behalf of his community. I respect the hell out of all that he's doing and, and the level of sacrifice that it takes to, to do that work. It's absolutely incredible. So I always appreciate his perspective, but also more importantly, him as a human being. So big shot to Hector. Now, with that said, I know we talked about a lot of really heavy things, a lot of nonsense. So, of course, as you always do, I want to end with some positivity in the form of a positive quote. Now, this week's quote is actually from a New York Times article. It's the headline of that article by Juan Gisti Cordero. And I apologize if I just butchered your name, Juan. But I thought the title of, of this article was incredibly powerful. And it's something that I wanted to reiterate, uh, you know, as we, we see all the tragedy and devastation happening once again. Uh, on, on the island of Puerto Rico, you know, where my, my family's from, where, where I call home as well, you know. And, and this title, this quote is, in Puerto Rico, we invented resilience. And I just found that to be so incredibly powerful and, and so affirming of the spirit of, of the people of Puerto Rico, right? And I know that it gets exhausting to to feel like we always have to be resilient, right? We are always having to bounce back from something. And, and my heart genuinely goes out to those who are just tired of, of always having to fight, you know, just for the bare minimum to be met, right? Just to, to be able to live their lives comfortably and to not be the target of, of modern day colonialism and, and natural disasters, right? I, I understand that. But I also want to just acknowledge the strength and resilience of the, the people of this beautiful island. And, and as always, we will get through this. And I want to make sure I include the name and, and websites of a, a few local organizations that are grassroots on the, on the ground, you know, boots on the ground, doing the work. I want to make sure I include them here. If anybody has the means to donate whatever you can, uh, it all goes to helping these people recover after, man, so much just tragedy seems to continue to fall on this beautiful island. Now, with that said, thank you all so much for tuning into another episode. I'll catch you all next time and we'll break it all down. Until then, stay safe and I'll talk to you all soon. Bye.